The question is, can we afford our net zero targets? Give me your views, Farage at gbnews.uk. Well, I've got two men joining me tonight with very different views. Bob Ward from the Grantham Policy Institute, Ross Clark, freelance journalist, you write for the Mail, the Telegraph, etc. Bob Ward, we all want a cleaner, better world to live in. We may disagree on how urgent climate change is, etc. I thought the admission today from Grant Shapps that renewable energy is expensive and will cost households more was very significant. Basically, you want to put a big heat pump on your house, you, get an energy, you, know, you will get a grant to do that. If you're using gas to cook, you're going to pay more. It's not very fair, is it? Well, he didn't say that renewable energy is expensive. In fact, he said the opposite. Renewable energy is now cheaper. I mean, remember the cost of energy crisis that we're having and the cost of living crisis is because of the cost of natural gas, which has gone up massively as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's our dependence on fossil fuels that's causing us a problem well, at the well, moment. Well, well, renewable, well, offshore wind is producing electricity at a far cheaper <coughs> price. Hang on a second. You're quite right. The initial invasion of Ukraine had pushed gas prices way up, but they're back down now, aren't they? Yeah, but at the moment, the problem is that we have a system that means that the electricity price is set by the most expensive form of electricity generation that is on the uh, grid at the moment, and at the moment that's gas. So even wind? though wind is cheaper, okay, we're okay. paying a price for electricity generated by wind, which is set by gas. And that, and has, that, been be right. that yeah. has been a rip-off. That has been a rip-off to consumers. Yeah. The fact that wind generation has been it's priced not, on gas. But it's gas. not the wind farm's problems, it's the regulatory system we set up. And Grant Shapp said today it needs reform so that consumers do benefit from the fact that renewable but energy But the wind is farms, cheaper. the wind farms could never have been built without taxpayer subsidy. That's right. When it first started, they were more expensive than fossil fuels. And so you apply subsidies and the prices come right down. And now it is cheaper than it is to generate electricity through gas. Right. So the idea that you invest in technology so that the price comes down over time, I mean, that's exactly what you want. We do that with all technology. If it was true, I'd be over the moon. Well, it is true. I would no, be over God. the moon. You should be over the moon. I would, no, I would be. I'm not convinced. <laughs> Ross Clark, you are very much a sceptic about these policies. You know, Bob Ward talks there about the fact that it, you know, the prices are coming down, etc. I was fascinated today by what Shaps had to say, because I got the impression that the poor will pay more for several years to come for their energy to subsidise the rich who are going to put in heat pumps and everything else. Have I got it wrong? Was today a big, a big transformation? Yeah, well, it's always the way with green things. I mean, the normal rules seem to be reversed. I mean, most times we, we don't have regressive taxes. We have progressive taxes where you earn more, you have more wealth, you pay more tax. But when it gets to green things, all that seems to go out of the window. And we pay huge subsidies to people with mansions to put in wood chip boilers and, um, you know, buy, you know, super duper electric cars and so on. And yet the, <coughs> the poor, poorer people, they end up paying the bills because they get late into the market after, you know, all the subsidies, electric car subsidies have gone. And, you know, they've all gone now, the purchase subsidies. Um, by the time the ordinary people, you know, are forced to buy electric cars, there won't be any subsidy. And it's the same with heat pumps. You know, we're putting these huge subsidies to relatively wealthy people to fit heat pumps in their house. But those subsidies will go eventually. And by the time, you know, the poor are forced to install them in their properties, they'll be paying the, the full... But Ross Clark, back. you are a climate change denier. No, I'm not. I do, I do not resile from the um, idea the, the climate is warming and that is almost certainly to do with car human carbon emissions. You but, so, yeah. but, you know, we've got to do something about it. But that has got to be balanced against having an economy and having um, people to, um, you know, having living, basic living standards. We could go carbon free tomorrow if we wanted to. We wouldn't have an economy. We'd have people starving. We'd have people shivering. And, and, and this is where climate realism, Bob Wall, comes in. So this week, the European Union, and I was there for many years inside their parliament, and they were the, the high priests of, you know, climate change theory. This week, they've decided that actually post-2035, 
internal combustion engines can still be made, because Mercedes, I think, wanted it and the big German car industry, but they will use e-fuels. We today, were Grant Shapps, are still committed to all cars after 2030 being electric vehicles. Now, I think in Beijing, they are absolutely, you know, cheering to the rafters because, because they will dominate the electric car market. Don't you think, whatever your views on CO2, and I, you know, I know where you stand on all of this, don't you think the EU, I can't believe I'm saying this, don't you think the EU is showing more realism on this issue than Grant Shapps? Well, I think the EU have caved into lobbying by uh, vested interests. The German car manufacturers have said, oh, we, we think electric vehicles are going to be, you know, part of the, the main part of it, but we want to have the opportunity to build these uh, other vehicles that are powered by e-fuels. Well, I mean, the Americans are making a bet on the electric vehicle market. They've made a massive investment in it. They're attracting businesses from the UK back to the United States because they believe in electric vehicles and the Chinese believe in electric vehicles. So we're going to have a battle here. And the question is, where do you think Chinese and American electric vehicle manufacturers are going to win out over the Europeans? And where should we be? I, I'm happy either way, but I just don't think that the answer is going to be that we should slow down on phasing out Petrol and diesel vehicles. Remember, 20, petrol and diesel are still expensive and electric vehicles will be cheaper. 2030 is unrealistic. What, why is it unrealistic? Are you giving up now already because the Germans have said, oh, it's too difficult, be the Brits can't no, beat that? No, I'll tell you why. Because without massive taxpayer subsidy and an increased cost for ordinary folk, it can't be done. Taxpayer subsidy. Look at the massive subsidy we're having to pay at the moment for our dependence on <laughs> fossil fuels. What's we're up having there? to pay people's What's bills subsidy? because it's too... What do you mean? The, what we've done at the moment is the price of natural gas is so high that the government has had to introduce a cap and is paying for because the increased price of natural we gas. Should be, it's a massive subsidy. We should subsidy. be producing our own. Now... Where, where are you going to get it from, Nigel? Do you want oh, to come back to fracking? The Boland Reserve, of course. <laughs> I knew we now, I knew we'd come back to now, fracking. Now, see, there we are. <laughs> so price is an issue. But have a look at this headline in the Times newspaper today. It really made me laugh. Because the Times are swallowing, hook, line and sinker, what the government are saying. Powering up Britain. Push to build turbines and ditch gas in dash for energy security. I don't think I've ever seen anything more illogical and more moronic than that. And I'll tell you why. Because we're going to actually make people who use gas pay more money. The poor, the rich, who can get away from it, will get subsidised by it. Bob Ward, whatever you say to me, forget price for a moment, let's get on to energy security. We, in the last few weeks, fired up two coal-fired power stations. Such was the risk that, literally, the lights would go out in this country. Isn't it insane to call the Shap statement today anything to do with energy security? It's the opposite. Green energy doesn't give us secure energy. There is no means of storing energy. We need gas or coal or whatever it is to back up wind. Yeah, so... Uh, you're absolutely right. We need to develop storage. We need to do better matching of supply and demand. But remember that our dependence on natural gas makes us insecure. At the moment, Why? half of the gas we use every year has to be imported. We, don't, we are not we, able to get it out of the We could produce our own gas. No, where are you going to get it from, Nigel? We've got massive... Decades of reserves of gas Fracking. in okay, Lancashire so, and Cumbria. So, let's go there, right. so I suggest that the next show, you go down to the people in pool and say how confident are they that the oil industry could extract ah, oil safely so let, when we've just had so an let, oil so leak the into the, the pool, world. into pool, and we've got now they're going to deal with the consequences of that for decades to come. It's going to affect the wildlife. It's washing <laughs> up on Brown Sea Island where you've got a rare red yeah. squirrel population. So it's fine if you could guarantee that it could be done safely, but the, what has happened is they say you cannot so attitude, and guarantee the safety so of the houses is, nearby. Your attitude is let the rest of the world suffer these risks and just, and just import energy. 
No, I'm saying we have domestic clean energy is our best source what? of sustainable, Forward. cheap, Forward. secure energy. What happens when the wind's not blowing? So you do need a solution. And so what you can do is you can have storage that provides electricity storage. And, <coughs> and I know, Nigel, that you tend to think that we'll never get beyond where we are now. But I keep mentioning to you that we've had huge developments in, in battery storage. Yeah. If you look at, for instance, the storage of batteries in mobile phones, they've improved massively. We are making, con uh, making huge progress. And if you bet well, against us ever... I'd like to take a bet with you now. To, I'd love to renewable, know. Renewables plus <clears throat> storage will be cheaper than fossil fuels right. 10 years Ross from Clark, now. Ross Clark, I've heard today, not just from Bob, but from Grant Shapps, energy storage and carbon capture will be major priorities. Mm -hmm. My problem is, I've been hearing this for 20 years, is it realistic? Well, the most interesting thing about today's announcement is this £20 billion going into carbon capture and storage um, development. Yeah. And what does that say to you? It says the government has coming round to realising that fossil work. fuels are going to have to have a future. Um, carbon capture and um, storage, I mean, it's a sort of embryonic technology hasn't been proven on a large scale yet, but um, if you're going to put £20 billion on it, why would you want to do that if you weren't coming round to realise that fossil fuels are going to have to continue to be part of our energy mix. And the reason for that is because of the um, intermittency problem. When the wind's not blowing, the sun's not shining, at the moment we are making up for that with gas. But by 2035, the government says he wants to do away with the gas. And um, what happens then? A really Clark, expensive Ross energy Clark, storage. Don't you think, just as the European Union this week has shifted its targets has eased back on its zero carbon commitments. This 2030 target, after which no internal combustion engines are going to be made, it's going to go, isn't it? I think it, we are going to have to go down the same route as the EU because no car manufacturer is going to make cars specifically for the UK market. They're going to, you know, they want to sell them around the world now. So, um, you know, if it becomes a standard product to have a, you know, hybrids in future or internal combustion engines um, um, powered by e-fuel, then, you know, Britain is going to going to have to allow them as well. Otherwise, you know, British motorists would have virtually no choice. Well, I agree. What you get on GB News is people who disagree very strongly, but civilised, proper, open debate. It's called critical thinking. You can make your own minds up at home.